Okay, so, so far in the chapter, we've, we've looked at uh, a few technologies that will help mitigate uh, CO2 production. We looked at one sequestration option. This next, um, this next chat section is called geoengineering options. So a lot of times I hear people say, you know, should we start geoengineering? Well, too late. You know, the, the, the Chinese did it with the Great Wall 3,000 years ago. Um, we, we've been doing it with our, with our highway infrastructure. In fact, you know, China is now building its own islands, you know, off, off the coast. So the, the debate as to whether or not we're going to do geoengineering is, is sort of been settled already. The question is, what are the next geoengineering projects that will be undertaken by our civilization if we're to... Um, China is building islands? Yeah. Wouldn't that be illegal? There's a little bit on the water. Well, um, some people think it's illegal, but they think it's just great. You know, they <laughs> built, built, uh, add to their land mass and, yeah. and uh, new, new places to park their toys. Yeah. <laughs> Where are they getting the material? Uh, I'm sure there's getting the material from mining. There's, uh, there's Michelle Wallamack. I don't know if you uh, know him or not. He's an alum of this program. He's got a... Uh, uh, countrymen there in Belgium has do, been doing similar things in, in Europe, and so I mean Holland geoengineered itself, right? Uh, you know, a lot of Holland is, uh, has been underwater for for centuries. So they, uh, uh, New Orleans has been geoengineered. They're pumping, you know, geo, it's under it's already un, under sea level. So um, anytime you have a big mining or dredging op operation, you have to do something with the material. So again. You've got a waste material, add some value to it. Now you've got a uh, your own little island. Richard Branson can buy it, stock it with flamingos, what have you. So, but another another thing that's uh, that this particular Belgian individual has been doing is making these uh, tidal islands. So in 102, we talk about uh, different tidal technologies. So if you construct your island in such a way that when the water rises uh, and you you store it, you can make electricity that way, and then again, when it, when it falls, you can use a, a barrage system. So, again, geoengineering uh, for electricity. Yeah. Okay, the, the, sh the picture we're looking at right now, though, um, this is on page 586, the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt, and the, region, the reason this is, is mentioned uh, it's, it's sitting right here. It says, carbon sequestration in oceans. It says that the world's ocean depths contain a vast store of CO2, about 37,000 billion tons. So uh, 37 trillion tons of carbon. Now, how much is that? Well, we know from, from summary three that technology emits about 35 to 40 billion tons of CO2 to the atmosphere each year. So it's basically the, the ocean has a thousand years worth of humanity's carbon emissions in it already. And it will continue to absorb CO2 until it becomes saturated like the lake we just mentioned and uh, bubbles, what have you. I don't think it's, it's nowhere near close to that saturation level, but it is messing with the, the chemistry. Um, yeah, so it says, or, you know, nearly 50 times as much CO2 as, as is in the atmosphere. Um, okay. Um, now, and here's what it says. It says the, the world... The, the surfaces of the world oceans are already saturated with CO2. However, some of that is slowly removed to the ocean depths. And that's what's going on right here. So if uh, these are the, the natural currents across the planet. So as this uh, hot water comes up, it's, it's more buoyant. It stays on the surface. As it gets colder, it then uh, dives down under uh, and, and, and flows back uh, down the Atlantic at, at lower depths. So a lot of that saturated CO2 water that's sitting up here is now heading down under uh, into the lower depths of the ocean. Another thing worth mentioning, um, this, this part of the world of Western Europe has elevated temperatures because of all that hot water. You've heard of the lake effect and all that, you know, the, the, the reason that uh, 
you know, parts of Michigan and, and Canada are warmer than they otherwise would be. It's because, the, you know, the lakes serve as a thermal capacitor, more or less. Same thing's going on here, except that water is transported to that, um, that part of the world. Another thing, um, as, um, as this water moves north, it's constantly being evaporated. Uh, as, it's, as it's evaporating, it becomes more dense uh, because of the salt in, inside, right? So salt water is more dense than fresh water, so the, salt, so the saltier and saltier it gets, uh, that also drives um, this flow. Now, there are, there are talks of if the Earth's temperature warms, this will uh, seriously mess with uh, these natural convective flows that we've been seeing. If this uh, is, is turned off, well, might be good news for Greenland. More snow up there, perhaps, uh, colder Greenland, but not so great for uh, Western Europe. Okay. Um, here's another thing. It says, and I just, what I just explained there was what's called the thermohaline circulation, or the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. Uh, now it says the second process depends on the fact that at the surface of the world's ocean, microscopic organisms called phytoplankton grow by photosynthesis, so they're sequestering carbon, harnessing, harnessing sunlight and absorbing the CO2 dissolved near the surface. Um, so that's one way that carbon is sequestered into the biosphere with these little phytoplankton are, are eaten. It says if they die, then they're, they're, it remains in their bodies and it sinks to the ocean. So that's another way that um, carbon is being sequestered into the ocean. And they mentioned this as the, the biological pump. Okay. A couple of other things that are mentioned here. Reforestation, obviously, it was, is, a, is a great way uh, to sequester carbon, restore forests. Biochar is, is mentioned, that was back in figure 1310. We've been making biochar right here with some of our processes and just kind of waiting for the, the market to explode on that. In fact, I've, I just had some analyzed over the, in the uh, clap building not too long ago. Another one, this is a little strange, but it's called solar radiation management or SRM. It's as, as explained in box 1.6. The Earth sits in a radiation balance between incoming solar radiation and outgoing infrared radiation. Right now, with the excessive CO2 in the air, um, we're getting sort of a, an extra one to two watts per square meter. It is sort of the, the, the magnifying glass, if you will. So, you know, with the solar constant being at about 1,000, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a tenth of a percent, but that's the additional uh, solar load that we, we see, and we, we, we read a paper about that in uh, 102. Um, so, uh, the question is, if you want to reflect that, so if you, if you just want to reflect 2% of the sun's energy, it would require very large projects. I'm not, I'm not sure if you've seen it or not, but there are already some um, ski resorts in the Alps that are putting these giant uh, white tarps down over their uh, mountainsides to reflect sunlight back, which just seems like a heck of a lot of work to me, but, um, it, you know, it's happening. And I, I think we, we might also see uh, building code in urban areas start going to more of a reflective mirror surface so that uh, a, lot, a lot of the sunlight is just, is just bounced back. And, and somewhat ironically, it says uh, sulfur dioxide emissions can actually lead to cooling. Uh, it says right here, the 1991 eruption of Mount Minitabu in the Philippines put so much dust and sulfur in the air that the global temperature actually dropped by a, um, a half a degree. So maybe someone wants to start a uh, volcanic triggering uh, business. <laughs> okay, so we've talk, spent a lot of time talking about carbon. The next little section here is on uh, the hydrogen economy, so fuel cells, energy conversion without combustion. We, we do have uh, here on campus a 100 kilowatt electrolyzer 
Uh, I'd love to see somebody um, get that baby set up back to life. I've been talking with Northwestern Energy about donating it to one of their wind farms to make uh, off-grid, or I guess on-grid, hydrogen. I could also see putting it at this Gordon Butte pump station. So hydrogen electrolysis is really nothing all that new. Uh, if you pass a current through, uh, through water, expose it to voltage, that actually breaks down the, uh, the hydrogen bond between oxygen and hydrogen. Um, oxygen accumulates at one of the electrodes and hydrogen accumulates at the other one. Now, they don't, um, they don't really operate by combustion. They operate by the, the flow, well, just the flow of electrons and the flow of other electrolytes. So you can see hydrogen itself, and so you've got the, uh, the anode here, the H2 fuel comes in, at the anode it's, uh, it's, it's split apart, and you just have really just single protons. Uh, flowing through this membrane, and then the electrons are left to thro flow through the electrical load. So the, the hydrogen itself, it, you, can, you can think of it like a battery, and that's why it's called a fuel cell. The, the, the cell is the battery part, and the hydrogen is the, is the fuel portion. Uh, oxygen also comes in from the air towards the cathode, and well, what are you left with? Uh, water and heat, there's your second law of thermodynamics in effect, and then um, obviously your, your electricity. So hydrogen and oxygen come in, electricity, heat, and water uh, come out. Um, table 14.3 shows the classification of various fuel cells, and there are many. Uh, some people say, well, gosh, which one's the best? Depends on the application, just like lithium-ion batteries might be better than alkaline in some place, nickel metal hydride better. Um, in, any case, in any case, you always have some type of precious metal, so nickel or platinum, sometimes ruthenium, chromium oxide, uh, yttrium is another one, zirconia. Uh, some operate at very high temperatures, some operate at low temperatures. The efficiencies are actually pretty good. If you look down, we're, we're at, we're at um, you know, bottom end 30%, top end 60% efficiency. You're not going to see that kind of efficiency in most other technologies. You're not going to see it in a, in, a, in a combustion process, and you won't even see it in a wind turbine process. So fuel cells will be a big part of our uh, energy future. The other thing worth mentioning, hydrogen is, a, is an example of a secondary energy source rather than a primary. So primary are fossil fuels, wind, etc. Um, hydrogen, you don't just go and get hydrogen from nature. You have to separate it from, from oxygen first. So it's a secondary uh, fuel source. Okay, and then um, I, I guess even as far ago, I'm, I'm now at the bottom of page 591, even as long ago as eight, 1874, The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne says two characters are, are saying, what's going to happen when we run out of coal? Well, we're going we're to burn water. And that's, that's really what, what a fuel cell is. Not burning it, but of course, but uh, electrolyzing it. So some energy has to go in to make that hydrogen in the first place. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from wind and solar. Okay, here's a schematic of a hydrogen energy system. In, in 102, we start to talk about integration, and that's more or less what this is. How do you integrate a, you know, emerging technologies uh, like fuel cells, uh, like hydrogen cars, with the um, uh, conventional. So this guy, um, so here you're still, we've, we've still got natural gas coming out of the ground, right? So there's still some kind of link to fossil fuels for the time being. Uh, natural gas is CH4, 
So the CH4, uh, the, the H's, the hydrogens, come, are, are then split off. Uh, oxygen as well comes in here. So the carbon, though, that was just sitting down here in the ground as natural gas is then stored as CO2, uh, and then that is uh, pumped underground or pumped into a um, algae farm or a greenhouse or what have you. But the rest of it, all these other little blue lines, uh, so the green lines, it's kind of hard to tell the green from the blue, but the green lines are natural gas, the red lines are carbon, so you can see none of that, none of that CO2 is actually making it into the air. What they're not showing here um, is, are the, uh, the water emissions. So if you've got a hydrogen-fueled airplane, it's still combining with oxygen and, and uh, steam or water is still the waste product. Water, by the way, is a greenhouse gas. They're called clouds, you know, um, but uh, that's, that's sort of the, 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 the waste or the emissions. Yeah. One, one problem, I don't know if I have this on the final exam, but an, an example of a problem that you're likely to see on the final exam would be to say um, if the world uh, burnt through or combusted X number of um, gallons of octane and that you know combined with oxygen in the combustion process, how many gallons or liters or tons of rainwater did you just make? Right, because in, in your, you, know, you see the stuff come out the tailpipe, it goes up, there's, you know, there's water in there, or is it gonna, it's going to turn into a cloud somewhere and come back down. So that's the type of question that, that you're likely to see on the exam. So you sit down and go, okay, so in this many gallons of gasoline, I have this, you know, there's, there's eight carbon molecules per um, octane. There's a little bit of chemistry involved, but that's, that's the type of question I'll ask you on the, on the exam. And again, it's fun. They're good head scratchers, and you don't you wouldn't necessarily even have to work through it um, by hand. You know enough from worldometers that you might even be able to take a, a reasonable guess at it. And I typically grade them as um, powers of ten. So if the answer is um, a million a million tons, your answer is six because. Uh, six is just, or a million is just 10 to the sixth. If it's one ton, you would answer zero because, uh, because one is 10 to the zeroth power. So on a lot of the final questions, you're just answering some integer value. So if I asked you what's the world's population, you wouldn't answer seven billion, you'd answer um, 10 because seven billion is very close to 10 to the 10th. Because 1 billion is 10 to the 9th, 10 billion is 10 to the 10th, so how many people are on the planet Earth? 10. So you're just, it's pretty simple, you're just, you're just answering in powers of 10, that's what a lot of it is. It's fun. Everybody's like, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad my favorite question was conveying my feelings. But if the, so if, you know, if I said, um, you know, how many, there's, there's 100 buses outside, how many buses are there? Zero. Two. There's 100 buses, the answer is 2, because it's, it's, it's 10 squared. Yeah. How, how, many, um, how many years are in a millennium? 3. 10, ten cubed. But no, but that you know, in my opinion, that's that's really what this uh, a big part of this class is about is is allowing you to um, think you know think in terms of big big numbers, big picture kind of stuff. Okay, so um, on table fourteen four, we're looking at properties of petrol, natural gas, and hydrogen. This takes us right back to summary one, the paper that I wrote. Uh, in 2000, started writing in 2004 and had published in 2008 because what they're looking at are the specific energies of these different fuels. So uh, jet fuel, which is kerosene, we're looking at 44 
megajoules per kilogram, petroleum pretty similar at, at 45, natural gas a little higher at 48, hydrogen, that's the big boy, at 121. So approximately three times the energy density on a per mass basis. No CO2 emissions and a very high um, higher heating value. If the difference between the higher heating value and the lower heating value means that you've recaptured the heat from the exhaust. And a lot of times you hear about condensing boilers. And so what the condensing boiler is doing, it's going after that higher heating value where the, the water that was going to be emitted as a uh, flue gas is then recondensed and the heat stays in the house. So that's the difference between a higher heating value and a lower heating value. Okay, here's the Honda uh, FCX Clarity fuel cell cars. I am yet to see any of these in, in Montana, but I, uh, from what I understand, they are happening in California. Uh, it does say future critical factors will be the development of a hydrogen filling station network and the availability of high purity hydrogen. Uh, we have one of those right here in town and we're looking for uh, love to have some investors to get that guy up and running again. We had to take it down when the new building was built. Okay, here's a hydrogen bus. You can see the high pressure tanks on the roof. The tanks that we have run at 5,000 psi, so kind of double what you'd see in a standard uh, uh, standard gas um, tank. Okay. What are the downsides? Well, hydrogen can blow up. Here's a shot of the Hindenburg. Uh, the German hydrogen-filled airship Hindenburg burst into flames at Lakehurst, New Jersey, May 1937, killing 36 people. I didn't know it, it was only uh, only that few, but I don't even remember. Do you, do you do you guys know how how far this thing flew ever before it actually blew up? I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a look here. Okay, so there it was. It was about to dock. After opening its 1937 season by completing a single round trip passage to Rio in late 37, doesn't that sound pretty killer though? Like floating in the big old ball of hydrogen, uh, South America. In late March, the Hindenburg departed from Frankfurt, Germany, uh, on the first of what were to be ten round trips. Is this? I mean, this is. Um, when did World War II actually start? What, what your, I mean, I think we're kind of, I, I think we're kind of, I mean, we're leading up to World War II here. I mean, I, I just read the book, uh, Boys in the Boat, that was 1936. Hitler was already up to his, um, whatever you want to call it. So I, I think this is still, still pre, uh, pre-World War II. Turn flight, tickets to Germany, hours behind schedule, passed over Boston. Um, there it is, right over Manhattan. Literally. One, one thing that I've been working with a little bit with, with NASA is to have a, a lighter than air winged aircraft. So the blimp that we're looking at right here, it's pretty slow. You know, it, it's, it's great that it's sort of staying afloat. You don't have to go fast to keep it al aloft. But just imagine um, something similar, but now you've got wings sticking out the side, better control systems, and faster propulsion. You know, so you're using the hydrogen for propulsion. And you're also using the hydrogen for buoyancy. So the uh, fuel efficiency 
should be less with a uh, overall less massive vehicle. Now, when I try and search it, it says my connection's not private. What's going on? Someone trying to hack my stuff? I don't know, man. Probably. You're, okay. you're, you're a wanted man there, really. Okay, so now we've looked at fuels, we've looked at sources. Now, the next section here is just called reducing energy demand. And if you remember, I, I think I had it, I know I had it here in my, in my talk. Oh, uh, this is from Shramsky, 2015. For better or worse, it looks like demand, well, I don't know. Um, allocation of energy per capita has declined. That's the green curve. We, we sort of hit peak energy per person a few years ago. And the question is, well, is this a result of poverty, like people can't afford energy, or is this a result of higher efficiency? So right here we see someone putting in insulation. Uh, this, this particular uh, Brunk estate in Germany um, talks, talks about much better insulation. Here's, here's some super thick insulation. In my opinion, if, if Missoula is going to get real, they should put a, a building code in that, that really requires uh, much, much higher insulation values than we're, than we're currently seeing. To answer your question, it's uh, September 1st, 1939. When World War II started? That's the start date. Yeah, World War II. yeah. Compared to this guy was... 1937? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're still a couple of years pre-World War II, but okay. Thank you. So. Energy demand, right there, it, it's, it's, it's already started to diminish. Um, this is total energy consumption, and I'm, and I'm not sure that's not for a lack of trying. We, you know, we are still trying like heck to get every drop of, of energy out of the, um, out of the ground. And the, 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 er, the world's population, you know, some people look at this and say, well, it's, you know, it's, it's, Linear, maybe it's slowing a little bit, and we're going to peak at 10 billion. Somebody else just told me the other day that India is lying about its population, and that there are actually 2 billion people living over there already. I have no way of knowing that. I've never been. Um, I'm not even sure how you count that many people. But um, somebody who says they think they know said that India is, for whatever reason, lying about how many people live on its little continent. They're saying they have less. It's in a less, fewer. Um, I just don't know. I, I don't know. I just I'm 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 merely uh, throwing that out as a scientific hypothesis that if you become a demographer, you might have the opportunity to test someday. All right. So here's another um, bit of energy efficiency for different modes of transportation. I love this type of figure. I, I did a similar paper not too long ago. We were working on building what we were going to call a, a bicycle highway or a bicycle interstate where, so I think a lot of people don't ride their bikes. Well, there's a lot of reasons. You're going to hit by a car. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too wet. It's too dangerous. You know, for whatever reason. But if you have a completely separate uh, bicycle infrastructure, I think people would love it. They'd eat it up. They knew they were going to get, you know, creamed by a car or, or frozen to death or, or soaked. Um, well, yeah, we're not respected the way we should be, even in this town, which is really forward-thinking, because when they plow the roads, what happens with our bike lanes? Well... They're filled with ice and everything else, and then you have asshole people commuting <laughs> who honk at you and swerve close to you because you're on the very edge of the road, well, creating lots of, you know, yeah. just being held up and splendid outdoor windows, and it's just... I, I'm, I'm surprised by that. When I, when I first moved to Missoula, you know, I, I was right. I don't, all I had was a bike, and I, I found people to actually be annoyingly courteous. But just this year, I, I've seen a I've seen a weird change where people are like flipping the bird. This whole coal rolling thing. I, I just I don't I don't get it. But um, coal rolling, yeah, yeah. Check it out. It's um, it's kind of kind of cute. I think it was, um, yeah, so here That's we go. That's exactly what I thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> I've had so many guys in big diesels come and drive up on the side oh, here and get yes. on it and just roast you in the yeah. black smoke. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a lot of them do it intentionally. 
it, it's it's a uh, <laughs> so it's a it's an aftermarket product uh, to I, intentionally not burn all the petroleum in the car. The and, story, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Happy Earth Day. Yeah. Even got the biker babes into the game. Uh, yeah, I, you know, it's it's just, it's cute, I guess. It's just, I, 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 re I refuse to get angry about it. You know, it's just. I don't get angry about it until they do it intentionally. Well, they're just driving by spewing their gas, well, cool, but it's when they obviously do it intentionally that pisses me off. Well, it's it's intentional. This, this doesn't look like the healthiest oh, behavior. Oh, this is great. Uh, Oh, here, Prius, Prius repellent. <laughs> I saw the funniest bumper sticker today. It was um, somebody said uh, powered, powered by, um, powered by recycled dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, it, you know, it's just it's just silly. Is is really all it is? It's it's kind of silly and and, and and fun little fad, in my opinion. Okay, so that's that. Um, but if if you see here, the megajoules per passenger kilometer for a bicycle is is really the the best we got going. Um, you know, it's one person, and you're you're burning. What is that? Uh, two tenths of a megajoule per kilometer. And well, if you if you look, um, this entire axis right here is one third of your metabolic load for the day, right? So each human needs ten megajoules per day. So if you were to triple the length of this axis, you would then basically see how far you could walk in a day, right? This, this person is making it one, one kilometer on two tenths of a megajoule. So two tenths to get to one megajoule is five, uh, 15. So yeah, this, just, this basically means that you could walk for 15 hours straight on the amount of food you, you ate. And I don't know if you guys listen to much of the um, scientific press, but some of the scientists now are like, you know, why and how did our particular very humble primate species become so so uh, popular and populous and powerful? And the guy said it's all about uh, bipedal locomotion. It's the fact that we can walk on two legs, and it is extraordinarily efficient. So here's your here's your walking efficiency, which is the second most um, efficient form of transportation. And we, you know, we could outthink other organisms, and by gosh, we could sort of out outrun them and outwalk them, outclimb them, whatever, to get away from the, the big beasties. <laughs> and so we're extraordinarily efficient with our own personal transportation. Uh, the the reason for seeing these two two separate lines are that uh, on a on a very full bus, you're going to have greater efficiency. But typically, not so much. And in fact, you know, a bus just drove by here. If it's got one or two people on it, then its efficiency might be, gosh, you know, even worse than a car, right? You got, you know, one one driver sitting in the bus with no people on it. Uh, what what's your passenger mile? Well, it's it, it's it's infinite. You're 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 burning all this energy for for no people riding. So that's why um, you know, the system becomes more efficient when there are more people on it. Okay, I think we're out of time there. We've just finished 14.5, we got 14.6. Um, and, and the rest of this chapter really is a preview for 102. Uh, all the technologies discussed at the end of, of uh, this, this book, which is, uh, which is Everett, kind of prepares us for Boyd. Yeah, I like this chapter. This is kind of the the happy chapter. This is the path forward chapter. Oh. All right, well, thanks. And again, please get your summaries in to me so I can grade them.
Um, we'll finish up this chapter, launch the last exam in a couple days, and I'll, uh, I'll let you know exactly when and where the final is going to happen. If you're taking the final online, you'll have a full 24 hours to do it. If you, if you come into class and want to get a hard copy, I can print that for you, and I'll give you a, a full day to finish it. it you know, it's, it's, it's finals week. You know, treat, it, treat it as such next week. Okay, thanks.